order, please, because we've got our technology and fix. And would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone for coming. This is better than going to a movie and, and much cheaper. Everybody is here. Going. And now. Now we'll have the swearing in of our new student council member. Joshua, would you please stand? Would you raise your right hand? Do you swear to execute to the best of your abilities the duties of a student school committee member, which include the following? To provide continuing input for the school committee deliberations, to strengthen communications between the school committee and district students, and to represent all students and facilitate the discussion of all sides of issues related to students. I do. Congratulations. <laughs> Mom, did you get a good picture? <laughs> Very good. Um, shall we formally sing happy birthday to Kristen, who's yeah. chosen to yeah. spend her, Chris, her birthday here? Thank you. Happy birthday, Kristen. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here celebrating. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Madam Superintendent, adjustments to the agenda. Thank you very much. We do have a couple this evening. On page one, we have added the nomination of Michael Griswold for the Winter Grade School Physical Education Teacher. On page two, section F3, Mrs. Gower will talk about the assignment of a school committee member to a homework review policy. And then finally, uh, we have some more communications from the main Labor Relations Board. And then I have added the finance documents under my report. And that's, those are the adjustments. Thank you very much. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the Winthrop School Committee meeting of September 4th. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Motion passes 5-0. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the Winthrop School Committee workshop meeting of September 18th. So moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Motion passes 5-0. Um, would the superintendent like to address the labor relations letters? Thank you very much. In your packet are several documents from the Maine Labor Relations Board. The first is a letter from Neil, and he writes to inform us that he has received a request for mediation services filed on September 12th. The next documents are from the Labor Board and the NEA requesting support unit mediation, and that's about it. Any questions for the superintendent? Seeing none, we'll move on. I'll entertain a motion to accept with regret the resignation of Karen Magnuson, Winthrop Grade School Physical Educator, effective October 11th. So moved. Second. Um, we've really certainly appreciated all of her contributions to our elementary school teachers. We wish her the best uh, the rest of her, uh, moving her professional career over to Veronica. And uh, we thank her again very much. Any other discussion? All in favor? With regret, motion passes 5-0. I'll entertain a motion to approve the nomination of Michael Griswold as Winthrop Grade School Physical Educator. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Ladd? Sure. Thank you. Um, Mike is here tonight. Welcome, Mike. Um, Mike has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sports Management from Endicott College, a Master's of Science in Recreation Management and Policy from the University of New Hampshire. He's worked at Camp Metchawana, Camp uh, Kennebec Valley YMCA in Augusta, 
and most recently for the city of Augusta as their recreation coordinator. Becomes very highly recommended and um, very uh, impressive in the interview process. I have to tell you a little quick little story. I <coughs> had a little kindergarten student today at lunch and she motioned for me to come over and she said, do you know my daddy? And I says, is his, is his name Mike by any chance? She goes, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> any, any additional discussion? All in favor? Motion passes 5-0. Welcome aboard. that we 
have in the right place people who are replacing people who have left. And that can get a little bit tricky because you have transitions between buildings, most commonly ed techs who might have been at the grade school and now they're at the middle school or, or vice versa. We want to make sure that we have compared a budget to the people, we want to make sure that the people we are hiring are comparing against the people, the budget that was passed, top money. Um, so Amanda and I discovered a setting in ADS that had been incorrect for quite some time. So we're now confident that that setting is reading the way it's supposed to read. Any questions on the expenditures at this point? So then we turn to our revenues. Revenues are just starting to come in as you turn, run your eye down through. Um, if you look at tuition, for example, we don't bill tuition until at least the first quarter is done. Most of our tuition students come from Fayette, and so we typically bill them four times a year. Um, the general purpose aid is where it should be. Uh, we watch Medicaid. Medicaid is somewhat unpredictable because it can come in slowly and then build throughout the year generally peaking in June. Any questions on revenues? So, so just so I'm reading this right at the end, on the revenues, the grand total, we're still expecting 77%. Yes. Okay. All right, we're rolling along. Uh, so enrollment report. Last year, as you know, we commissioned enrollment projections to help the district look forward. This is the first year we can compare those projections against the actuals. So we are down a fair number of students, uh, roughly 21, 22 kids. We're also down against the enrollment projections. So the enrollment projections had projected us around 888. For October 1st, we actually came in at 866, so about 22 fewer students. But students seem to be spread evenly among the grades. It's not like it's all grade four, grade five, like the high school. I included in your packet uh, some analysis regarding the superintendent agreements and homeschool account. I've done this last year for you in November. It's a little bit earlier this year. So we, and I'll just turn to that, this is page 27 of your packet. Um, we had 24 students request and receive superintendent agreements, and then I broke out where those students attend. Um, most of them are at the grade school. And then I went through some of the reasons that people gave for superintendent agreements. Uh, 21 students requested to receive superintendent agreements to attend school outside of Winthrop. And then I went through where those students were attending. Very similar reasons were given for leaving the district, daycare. Um, many students gave the reason that they had grown up in a particular district and they wanted to stay there. And when we can, we accommodate those requests. Um, and then I thought it might be interesting for you to know that 12 students were denied superintendent's agreements, and of that number, four were appealed to the SDOE, the State Board of Education, and two were overturned either at the commissioners or at the SDOE levels. Um, and we have 28 homeschool students in the district right now. Any questions about some of that data? This may be preemptive before the vote in November, but um, I'm just wondering what's going to happen with um, schools with kids who are not immunized, and that's going to be a whole other topic, and I don't know how many that even affects in the vote, but. I have no idea yeah. how to answer that. That would be just really like something to on the radar, yeah. depending on what happens in November, to start looking into. It's my understanding that because of the people's veto request, that's been stayed okay. for right now. And the actual exemptions, the ones that were most controversial, don't go into effect, I think it's until 2021. Okay. Um, but it is something to be aware of, because there are other changes that were part of that bill that were not the most controversial ones. Okay. Joe? Question. Uh, the total of uh, 28 homeschool students, they're not included, however, in the number of students attending the No. So they're as a separate category. That's right. So I, I, I just wanted to express my concern then to the superintendent with that, that number of fewer students we can expect less um, um, state aid because of our lower numbers. And this is gonna, that's concerning. Huh? You are correct. That is concerning. Um, that's something to watch. 
we, are we ready to roll along? I'm sorry, I'm so long-winded tonight. So the, the next item is our technology update. And if I might, I'd like to introduce Mr. James Corbin. If you wouldn't mind popping up and saying hello to the group. Tell us who you are. Um, James Corgan with CR Technologies. Um, we're a uh, communications and technology company. I don't know how long you want me to go on. Uh, we got locations in Bangor and in, in, uh, in Winthrop. That enough? I think it's perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> because I'm going to talk a lot more. Okay, so. perfect. <laughs> um, so, in your packet is a memo from me talking just a little bit about how we got to where we are regarding Sierra Communications. So, in paragraph one, two weeks before school was scheduled to begin, two of the building computer educational technicians resigned, and shortly thereafter, the network tech network technician, power school, and they also resigned, which left us four vacant positions because a new position had been added as part of the district budget, with only 1.25 position being filled, and that was at the high school. So we were really up against it, and we needed to act very quickly. I was very grateful. I think some of the school committee members gave me Mr. Corbin's contract, contact information that proved to be really helpful. So we have met pretty regularly, and we stay in touch by phone almost daily to come up with a plan to meet the needs of Winthrop schools. Um, I met with them, we talked about a performance and monitoring system to monitor our backup devices, centrally manage and monitor our antivirus system, and it's just, this stuff is so far over my head that I have to confess that I feel like I put a lot on them to help me understand the technical pieces of it. Um, the comprehensive coverage would be 764501 for 68805 for the remainder of the year. And the way we are able to accommodate that is we do have the unfilled positions in technology. And that's the way that we are able to make that work. Um, I also included in your packet, because I needed to do this quickly, the school committee currently has a policy which is bidding purchasing requirements. It's NEPN NSBA code DJ. And I referenced the back of it where the circumstances, and I indulge while I'm reading here, that the circumstances surrounding our technology needs allow me to forego the competitive bid or RFP process as I deem that the quote, quality expertise, technical <coughs> factors, or other important considerations outweigh the possible benefit of bidding or requesting proposals. We were in an emer emergency situation at the beginning of the school year, and we needed to act quickly. They came with a complete menu of options that I think we needed, and I am entering into an agreement with them tomorrow. Part of the policy is that I need to let you know tonight um, that I plan to do that and execute that agreement. Be happy to answer any questions or Mr. Barton can as well. Um, this isn't necessarily about um, what Sierra Communications is bringing, but it's more of looking at what the, our technology department and how it was functioning in our three schools. I know that there have been a lot of conversations with our administrators as what was working. Um, this was a good time to kind of reevaluate. But what Sierra is providing to us, is there anything that is not going to be um, supported or provided in the schools, is there, like, is there a part of our need that isn't being filled? It's a great question. They have established help desks for each of the buildings as well as the superintendent's office and technicians on site. I think what is inherent in this, under, in this arrangement is that staff need to become more independent in their use of technology. And I can speak for myself, so I can't figure out how to turn the printer on. I'm going to have to have learn because there's not somebody in my building who can just come, or Richard who can just come and figure out that I just have to start the printer again or start my computer over again. People are going to have to have some level of independence. Um, I've talked with the building administrators about this, and we all understand that for the remainder of 1920, we're going to have to evaluate our needs and be prepared to recommend to the school committee either through the budget process or certainly for the beginning of July 20, what the technology needs will, will look like. And I was interested in your choice of words, technology department. I'm not sure we have a technology department, even though one of my, I guess, 
titles as Director of Technology. Um, I wouldn't say that we had a good coherent department. That's something we need to take a look at. I might just be a, a comment as well. And, um, <clears throat> I tend to agree a little with teachers being a little bit more independent, but I hope there's training on some of these things. Um, we get all new computer, uh, photocopies in our district and not one of us was trained on them. We had to figure it out on our own. And that's very frustrating when you walk into a building and boom, there's a new photocopy and nobody tells you anything about it. So I hope that there's some sort of, if teachers need help, that there's someone, I don't know what the help desk actually does or who or what, but if you're walking into a lab with a bunch of kids and you don't know what, you're not, that's not your area of expertise, it can be really frustrating as teachers and I just, I hope that there's not, I don't know if there is that level of frustration, but that kind of worries me a little. I think it's an excellent suggestion in terms of training and what people need. What we've discovered, and I'm a dinosaur when it comes to technology, that the folks coming into classrooms right now are way ahead of me in terms of their technologically savviness. Um, we, where's Karen? Karen, what's the name of that board at your place? The big? Uh, it's a Pro V projection board. So we now put those in many classrooms, and the reason I use that as an example is because there we do need some technical help in making sure that the software systems are loaded and, and ready to use. And once they are, then we can certainly provide training for people to use them. Any other questions about uh, technology? Joe? Do you need a resolution to support uh, the contract with the CEO? Um, I think the policy gives me the authority to enter into an agreement, and I don't need a resolution. I'm happy to answer any other questions. If, I mean, I, I deem this to be a pretty significant emergency. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm okay with that, given the policy that is Oops, sorry, here. Okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, so let's see, technology, and then uh, I think that is it. Thank you. Okay, um, school committee chair report. I just, I just wanted to share with everyone the passing of some really good uh, friends to education in the past about 40 days. Megan Antonucci, which put together the books for our incoming kindergarten folks to welcome them to our community, even though she hit both pillars, the front door there one year. <laughs> um, she worked on those as well as the rest of the committee for many, many years. Um, as well as the passing of Bob Edwards and Costa Smurls, who put together, um, um, uh, gave to our students over 70 years of their expertise. So. Costa Smurls and Costa Edwards. Mm -hmm. yeah, in the last week. Yeah. Um, the next on the agenda is the evaluation of and, and development of new uh, school committee goals. And I, I didn't receive any except from Mrs. Cook who put them together and sent them to me before she went on her trip. So um, what is your pleasure, school board? We, we should have some goals to go through. I have one suggestion that um, we could very quickly go through the old goals, I think, we did an okay job with those. And then I can make some suggestions, some suggestions of uh, new goals. We can do it that quickly or we can delay it. But the new goals might be something like, <coughs> excuse me, hire a new superintendent, um, facilitate the building and facilities um, summary, and negotiate two contracts that we still have outstanding. And what is your pleasure? Um, another suggestion along those lines that Joe had brought up um, is to look at um, a pay scale for teachers because if, the, if in fact the legislation is going to go through that the starting salary needs to be $40,000, um, we're thinking that it might make sense to try to come up with some sort of structure of higher to do the year that it needs to be. 40, since we're not we'll figure out how to pay for it. So that might be um, a good goal for us to work on this year, if in fact it goes through. 
Any other thoughts? What would you like to do? Would you like to officially call those our goals? Or would you want to put that off? I just figured you're all pretty well overwhelmed and didn't have time to get into um, I Those were what I had primarily hiring the superintendent, the building study and budgeting of that, um, and then what I just added. So those were mine, so I'm fine with those becoming our goals. So can we do that right now? Sure. Okay with you, Joe? Okay, so uh, I offer then the following goals. And um, I hope we can get all this coding. So it would be to hire a superintendent, to function the building and facilities summary, to negotiate two contracts, and um, to create and figure out, that's a bad phrase, figure out how to pay for uh, the new a new teacher scale in the event that the forty thousand dollar minimum goes through. It's, 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 it's a planning planning process. Planning in the right? Is that better yes. terminology? I don't know. Planning in the right? Planning create. Uh, planning create. Yeah. Because we have to actually have to get it created. Yeah. Planning create. Yeah. Planning yeah. create. Yeah. Yeah. Planning create. 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 Okay, we all in favor? Mm -hmm. Yep. Delightful, it's done. Uh, we, we, if you recall the last business meeting that we had, we tabled a homework, uh, the review of a homework policy. I don't have the, the code for it right here. But it was tabled because our new curriculum coordinator, oh, I'm sorry, our new director of teaching and learning, thank you, Sorry, Matt. Sorry. So, <laughs> um, Dr. Brown thought it would be better if he were, was given the opportunity to uh, coordinate several policies around all, around all of that. So it was tabled for that time. He has started work on that already, and he is starting to put together a um, very diverse um, uh, committee. And um, we're wondering if there's anybody here that's interested in serving on a homework committee. I know that Kristen has, um, has shown some interest in that. Is there anyone else that would like to buy for that job? Kristen, would you like to be appointed to that? No, you don't want to. You OK? Meg, you going to fight her for that opportunity? <laughs> so if you're okay with being appointed? Okay. Uh, Kristen Shumway is appointed to your committee now. <laughs> Standing committee reports, finance. We haven't moved since last time on the warrants, but we're going to take care of that next week. And um, policy committee, Mrs. Cook. We met this evening. Um, we have the minutes of our last meeting in your packet, and we're going to be bringing forward uh, one policy for passing and another one for first reading. Thank you. Negotiations? Shumway? As uh, Dr. Brown um, intimated earlier in the meeting, both groups have entered into uh, mediation. And so we've been um, officially filed that. We have received the information back from the state, and so now it's out of our hands. We'll be notified. Um, we have to pay a fee, and then we'll be notified of the next steps. I think we've already sent in the check. Yeah. Administrator open forum. Who wants to start? Okay. Yes, please. Um, just want to update you on LD 1715, an act to reorganize the provision of services for children with disabilities from birth to five years of age. That's one of the bills um, that was passed. Well, it's, I'm sorry, it's carried over to this year um, about moving CDS services into the public school system. Um, so what the department is doing right now is they're gathering information about the challenges to that um, 
whatever they're going to do in the next few years. Um, I was part of a stakeholders group a couple of weeks ago. They did it by superintendents um, region and looking at those challenges and then the information from that is to go to the DOE and um, uh, going back to the education committee and the legislature. So that's one thing that is happening with that. Nothing has been written in stone yet about what they're going to do. Um, and the other piece is there is a stakeholders group and actually Kim Feeney, who's um, one of our speech pathologists here, she is on that group and they are meeting to gather information also. So there's no specific plan in place right now, but it, they are moving in that direction and they're doing it a little bit more pragmatically than they did before. So some of the challenges definitely are funding, space, transportation, things like that. So they're looking at all of that. So it's not something that's going to be happening in the next year, but I would see it being transitioned in gradually, like we'd be responsible for the four-year-olds first and then the three-year-olds next. Um, between now and probably 2023, 20, 2024. I think that's what they're looking at. So I thought I'd update you on that. I'm not hitting us yet, but it is coming our way. Um, the other piece is that um, because of all of this in the last few years, CDS uh, is not getting the staff they need to provide the services to pre-K students and birth to five-year-old students. So they're really, um, looking at schools to see if there's any way that we can provide some of those services. So when I spoke to my speech pathologist last spring, um, one had <coughs> some time and she was used to working with the CDS system, so she took on some pre-K students. And from early spring to the end of the year, we were able to build the state fair $8,000 for those services. She has picked up some kids also this spring, so we are providing some services to the four-year-olds in speech right now. So. Thank you. Yep. So you think that there's no way we're going to get a, get a way to get out of doing the... I, I think the train is going down the tracks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's starting to gain some speed. I think it is coming our way, and I think the more that... Um, the closer we're getting to that time, the more they're hoping schools will assume because they just do not have the services. Kids are not being identified. Kids are not receiving the services. Kim provided speech services through the summer um, for five weeks to catch some of these kids up who went months without services. And we were able to build this summer also for those services. So, um, And I tell her, if we have the availability, we will, we can do it but our children come first, right. and, and their needs come first before we provide services. But um, they're the cutest little things you ever saw, because <laughs> I see them coming from my office. Thank you. Who would like to go ahead? So a couple of weeks ago, just three weeks ago now, we had our fifth grade parent um, band instrument rental night and we have about 50 fifth graders that are signed up for band and they're already uh, playing hot cross buns when they come in in the morning down on the stage oh, 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 oh. so they actually they sound pretty good I think it's going to be a good band group this year oh uh, yes um, for our early release uh, I wanted to thank Christy Grant and Lauren McHatton they did an excellent job providing the required uh, sexual abuse awareness training and we were also able to sneak in a couple of curriculum um, committee meetings. Uh, Jolene Randall chaired the literacy committee and Matt met with the math committee the first time. And Matt has since had a follow-up with the math committee uh, last night and they've started work uh, towards coming up with some shared understandings for future math curriculum. And today was picture day. Thank you. Who's up? Who's up, Miss Chris? Okay. Today was picture day at the middle school too, and um, I just have to tell a little funny story that Jeff just showed me his last two years school badges, and he has the same tie on he has on today. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> Predictable. <laughs> to say nothing. Um, last year.
year, Mrs. Plasse's sixth grade class, our present seventh grade, entered two contests, the Pioneer <coughs> Poetry Contest. 11 students have been chosen to be published. She also entered the sixth graders into the Young Writers Contests, and 40 out of the 60 entered um, have qualified to be published. Good news right there. Middle school oil tank passed inspection. Yeah. We have had two Pro V projection boards installed. It was Christmas in September in those two classrooms. They're, they're a cheaper version of a smart board or a Promethean board. So they're Pro V projection boards. They are fantastic. All students now have laptops in their hands. Some of them may not work, but they have that. <laughs> I would like to once again give kudos to Amanda Knowlton and Katie Allen who have worked on the weekends and evenings to re-image, repair, and clean all of the laptops in the middle school. Wow. Thanks to Mr. Corgan and his team, I now have access to the Winthrop Middle School webpage, and I'm trying to unlink all of the links that go to outdated information. The Winthrop Middle School Library honored banned book weeks and we got quite a few comments on some of the books that had previously been recommended to be banned across our country from our students. Love on a Leash, Love on a Leash came for the first time last Friday afternoon. We had two beautiful dogs being read to by sixth graders for the last hour of the day. The book fair, uh, Scholastic Book Fair raised over $500 in free books and because the students reached um, over a thousand dollar threshold of selling books, um, they have won the prize of watching <laughs> Dr. Brown and I have a silly, silly string fight. <laughs> we will have the silly string playoff. <laughs> No, yeah. that ain't in school, Miss Geyer. You know that. We got in trouble for the cow flop bingo. Come on. We're <laughs> gambling in school. You know that. Friday is our annual problem trip, and as always, it's going to rain and be freezing cold. We have many retirees joining us, including Mark Fortin, Sally Stone, Jim Baker, Verdell Jones, Tom McGuire, and Al Fuller. Always a fun day. Let's go, 5210 sent a letter to the Winthrop Middle School um, congratulating the Winthrop Middle School cafeteria for last year's effort trying to become a healthy calf. That's it, you're done. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And remind me next oh, month. I gave you plenty of chance to stand. I know, I'm not gonna follow her again. <laughs> I'm gonna be kind of dull and boring. So, um, Mr. Stone is up attending games here today, so i just give a quick report. Our athletic teams are headed into their second month of competitions, and all are doing very well this fall. Um, next week is the big week. It's homecoming week at Winthrop High School, and everyone is welcome to come chaperone the homecoming dance with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. What time does that stop, Josh? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Seven o'clock. Oh. So I'm going to pass out. I, I talked earlier in the fall about um, the number of students that we have enrolled on in online classes. Um, we have students enrolled at KBCC. We have students enrolled at UMA. Um, we have also have students taking classes through virtual high school and as well as um, Middle Earth Language Institute. These students have made these choices because one, um, they had a schedule in their conflict they really wanted a uh, solution to and not have to give up a course they really wanted to take. Um, some of these students wanted to explore some career options um, and others simply saw it as an opportunity, hey I can get for example my English college comp class out of the way now in, as senior English and it certainly would invite anybody sitting here who has had that experience to share what it's like to take a class on Mark. Um, well, for my class, I know there's like, they broke it up into like two different professors. My professor, we usually have like things to do on Thursdays, 
and Sundays, and like right now I'm in the middle of writing an essay over like an article I read, and I really like it so far. And what has impressed me about the students doing the online classes, it's, it's not like Miss Shaw is there saying, hey, don't forget you got an essay due Friday. I mean, it's posted on Monday, and they know the deadline's Friday, and it's up to them to follow through. And, and I've asked them to share their grades with me, and thumbs up. I'm really very impressed with the grades that I've seen from students on through these online classes. Um, we also have started this year um, three math classes through the high school math department that also are dual enrollment. So students taking stats, college algebra, and pre-calculus are receiving high school credits and credits either at KVCC or at UMA. So oh, teachers went out and sought those experiences for our students, which is great. <clears throat> All is going well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chef? Well, um, yesterday we started with, uh, October 1st, we started with the first menu that um, I've written for the school. So um, in September, we were still following my predecessor's menu. Um, we've made a few changes uh, to the menu. We're working on getting more homemade um, entrees in, on our lunch menus. Uh, we've been doing some rearranging where we can, and the high school is the most modern cafeteria. So we've been able to switch some equipment around and add some equipment. Previously, um, when students walked into the high school cafeteria, the first thing they saw was pizza, and what they ate every day was pizza. And we've moved the pizza around a little bit. It's in a, in a pizza oven. And um, the first thing that they see when they walk in are um, a cooler with fresh ingredients, fresh fruit, fresh salads, and grab-and-go sandwiches. Um, in the grab-and-go section, which we started yesterday, a student can grab a to-go container that contains a sandwich and also a fruit or a vegetable to make a reimbursable meal. We're trying a variety of different sandwiches to see what the kids like. And um, in the grade school, we've made a change where the first thing the students see when they walk in is a table full of fresh fruit. And it, this is the age where we want to start them off, and it seems like it's going really well where they're, they've learned that they have to grab a piece of fruit before they proceed. So they grab their fruit and their milk and then they come in and get their hot entree. Uh, the middle school is the most difficult challenge because of the facility. Um, we are you know, making the same kind of changes to the menu as in the other schools, but we can't physically change things around um, because of, of what we have there. But it seems like we've get, been getting a lot of positive feedback. We, uh, a child was overheard saying in the grade school, oh, look at the pretty tablecloth. So even the kids are noticing that we're covering an old ugly table with a fruity, fruity looking tablecloth. Um, we've had a lot of positive feedback from staff, you know, mentioning that they've noticed that the, the options are fresher and um, more homemade. Uh, we started purchasing from a local farm, Emory Farms, and I'm going to be attending a conference put on by the state tomorrow and Friday about farm to school. Um, they'll be offering me tomorrow a half day with actual vendors that I can purchase from. And Friday is an all day um, session on how you get reimbursement for farm to school and how you can get more fresh foods in your cafeteria. So I think that's about it. Um, uh, my high school um, manager, Diane, reported that um, since we moved things that the, the high school kids are eating less pizza, so. Oh, good. Uh, Chef, Dr. Brown has a question for you. Dr. Brown no longer has a question. Matt? Well, the two things that I have, because so I'm about to do a little presentation, so the two things I had, they've already talked about with the okay. homework committee okay. and the math committee. Well, so they stole right all the thunder. Yeah, so uh, let me, let me set this up. Of the state of the Winthrop curriculum by Mr. Shea. So here we go. So, what I put together is just some of the things that I've been gathering over the last uh, couple months that I've been here, uh, talking with teachers, talking with administrators, uh, talking with a few kids, uh, trying to figure out where we where we are overall. So, some of the things that I've heard about uh, from teachers, especially that there are constraints of time. 
that prevent them from doing some of the cool opportunities they want. So that's, that's like scheduling, uh, some of the amounts of time that they have, whether it's 50 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever it is, it's not enough time to do some of the cool things. Uh, so that's one of the, the questions that teachers have. Uh, there's a lack of cohesion in the curriculum from grade to grade. Uh, there's, there's a great curriculum for first grade, a great one for third grade, a great one for fourth grade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but they don't really flow <coughs> well together. That makes sense. Thank you, Tiff. So in that case, they feel we're creating gaps in learning uh, that happen from grade to grade, which is a pretty typical Thing to worry about. Uh, they feel really bad about it, they know it's happening, but they don't really have anyone to help them fix that un until now, of course. Th there wasn't anybody to be able to do that. Uh, one thing that I hear, and this is also very common, there's a lot of talk about pressure to cover things in their grades, in their classes. Uh, just covering things, but not necessarily about learning. I've heard this from all the districts that I've ever worked in, a lot of pressure to cover. So when I ask, where does that pressure come from? They're like, well, uh, I don't know. So I ask, is it coming from the principals? Is it coming from the kids? Is it coming from the superintendent? They're like, no, no, they're fine. They, they don't tell us that. But that's just a teacher thing, because I've, that's been in every district that I've ever worked in. There's also a lot of pressure. Teachers feel pressure to do a great job and they want to cover everything they're supposed to because uh, they want to do well. So with that pressure that's happening and the lack of a curriculum that, that, go, that flows from grade to grade, from building to building, uh, we're creating those gaps. So we're trying to figure out what to do with it. So I've narrowed this down to like three things that teachers want to see. So they want to see a consistent curriculum that's rigorous and consistent from grade to grade. A lot of common language is something that I hear quite a bit. Uh, that we don't talk the same way from building to building or from grade to grade, sometimes within the grades, uh, because there is no consistency. Uh, they would like a better way to track evidence of learning. Uh, this doesn't mean uh, getting rid of power school and getting something else. That is not what they're talking about at all. They're just talking about ways to try to figure out where kids are so they can better help and support them. Uh, and the third thing is they need a lot of training uh, and asking for training and begging for training on ways to help them just to become better at what they do, which is awesome. Uh, so those are the three things that I was hoping to bring to Winthrop when I got hired, and, hope, and fortunately that's exactly what we're looking for. So, so far so good. So one of my plans are for each one of these, uh, meeting with teachers to help develop that learning progression for all the subject areas. Uh, developing conversations around <coughs> rigor and taxonomy. So it's not just about standards. You have to have some type of rigor uh, to support those standards. Uh, and working with teachers to develop those cool cross-curricular experiences. Uh, and that gets back to a lot of the time that they need to do. So maybe we can talk about uh, if you had like your wish, what, how would you organize yourselves and, and how would it look differently so you can provide those things and start those conversations. For the second one, to better track uh, evidence of learning, uh, this one is honestly going to be a harder one for me. Uh, so we'll get to some of the some of the stuff what I'm going to do a little bit later. But we're going to have discussions about evidence versus grading, uh, and what does it mean to have enough evidence. Uh, I'm a big fan of preponderance of evidence versus just averaging things together, because uh, you're looking for kids to learn and not just uh, have a grade necessarily. Uh, so that one's going to be a tougher one, a longer one, because you have to have some type of foundation beforehand, and that would be the progression in A. Uh, for C, for training, uh, we're going to train on some elements chosen by Winthrop for teacher evaluation. I've been asked to do that and provide some PD. Uh, learning <coughs> ways to help learners learn. Uh, it's not necessarily about a program, but it's about figuring out how are we going to meet every learner's need. Uh, our schools have been the same since the 1800s. We're not really designed to do that, but we know that the world is different now and we need to meet all of our learners' needs. So how are we gonna do that? And one of my goals for this particular one is responding to what teachers are asking for on a timely basis. Um, one of the ones that came up just last week was about <laughs> teacher evaluation and training on those elements. Uh, that's not something I had planned on, but it's what they're asking for, so it's my job to fix that uh, and to help support that. 
So some PD that we've already started, uh, we did some training on learning menus. Uh, it's a way to provide learners choice in their learning, I'm offering the same session uh, six times this month, three times at the middle school, high school, and three times at the grade school because of the time differences. We started one of those right before this meeting. Uh, it went very, very well. I was very happy. And starting next week, uh, there's a letter in your packet tonight about uh, new teacher training. Uh, because something that happened in, in my old district, we had a lot of turnover in one particular building one year. So the principal, instead of having uh, staff meetings all the time, had the new teachers get together on the off weeks and try to figure out what do new teachers need. Uh, it's different from just running the building, but they have to know like how to use the photocopier, how to, when do I go to the bathroom? Uh, and all those little things that don't really come up in staff meetings, but we're, it's a place to get together and really talk about how, how do we do it here in winter. Uh, we're starting that next Wednesday, and I've already got some responses that people are actually coming, which is good. So more PD that I've got planned, but no times yet. Uh, progressions of learning, I'm going to start over the next couple months. Uh, question formulation technique, which is a way to help your learners uh, engage with the content a little bit more. We do that right after the winter break. Uh, something called setting up for independence talks about um, SOPs and flowcharts. That'll start in November and go right through the end of the year. Grading practices in the late spring, in the early spring, excuse me. <coughs> and then starting in November, those elements of teacher evaluation. Any questions? Questions from Mr. Shea? Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to make, make a comment first. Yep. I'm really pleased with this presentation. I've only been sitting here for a few years. This is the first time I've heard this presentation. And uh, frankly, I've been waiting for it since probably the first year for this anyway. Uh, but my second thing is the consideration that's really between you and the, and the superintendent. But um, at least within my circle, the people I talk to, there's a little bit of surprise about hiring a director. And part of this was that some superintendent, who I think is the current one, in fact, went to a meeting down here at the mill and mentioned some of the different titles that she had. And one of those was that she was the director of curriculum. And of course, the other one was that she was also the director of finding the vermin and other pest control types of things, too. And so the question became is, why can't the superintendent do these things? And I've tried my best to explain that the superintendent has a lot of things to do, but uh, we really need to specialize in this area. And so my suggestion would be is that you might want to consider writing this type of presentation into some kind of a, uh, an upgrade that uh, makes its way into the community advertiser. So that the people could know little things like you're working with teachers and you're listening to them, you're finding out what they need. Uh, you, you're, you've already found that the lack of cohesion is there. This is a word that most of the people I talk to have no idea what cohesion is, but, but it's important this is part of the uh, continuousness uh, of the educational process. So that's where I come down on this thing, is that thank you for being here and doing the work that you're doing. I think the system is going to, the community is going to benefit from all of this. Uh, but if there's a way of getting this more public, I think this would play us all well. No offense to uh, Ms. Shore and, and the work she's doing, which is what we want to have done. It's just another way of people learning about what's happened. Oh, I think it's great. Can I just, Thank you. Um, Mr. Krakowski, you were instrumental in wrangling an invitation for a couple of us to talk to the no, chamber no. and no. uh, Rotary. <laughs> Might you do that again? Yes. For yes. Mr. Shea? Oh, yeah, I could do that. Thank you. I would you too. <laughs> so if you might get that together. And I've and done my best not to join any of those groups. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, it's nice to have it in the advertiser. I also think it in person goes a long way. Good idea. Yep. We'll talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on along, continuing 
business. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the revisions to policy IGDJD, interscholastic co curricular and extracurricular activities. Um, I'm going to move that we adopt the revisions to policy IGDJD, interscholastic co curricular and extracurricular activities, with some changes that I'm going to mention right now. Okay. Second. Thank you. So, uh, if you find your copy Can I of, stop you for just a yeah. second? I always forget this part. Is there any public comment out there from anyone uh, that will help us make a determination on this policy? Seeing none, go ahead. Okay. Do you have your copy of the policy? Do I have mine? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. Okay. We don't have them in our. So, in this policy, there are seven small changes. You can keep count, see if I get them all. On page two, uh, under eligibility requirements and specifications, right before the yellow, take out four and substitute in. So the form must be completed and turned in for each sport in which the student participates. Uh, page five, in the uh, so number two. this question. Yeah. In this policy uh, that we're looking at, the yellow is being eliminated? No. The red no. Being eliminated. The strikeouts are being eliminated. Okay. That's all I want to know. Yep. And the strikeouts, I think, are in red. Red. And some are in blue. Yep. But, okay. And there's one in yellow. Right? We're looking at copies that have a lot of colors. Yep. Right? Okay. Right, so. No, the, in this one, the yellow is in. So on number two, non-voluntary referrals, first offense under number one, at the end of that line, it should say active participation in, not of, competitions. On page six, under, under third offense, Under third offense B, distribution and sale of alcohol or other drugs, first, uh, sorry, under, under B, distribution and sale of alcohol or other drugs, first offense. It read, now reads, the administrator will notify the superintendent, period, and then strike and law enforcement. And then it continues, the administrator shall suspend the student for 10 days and Strike up and put in may. Shorten the word recommendation to recommend. And then cross everything out except expulsion. So it now reads, the administrator shall suspend the student for 10 days and may recommend expulsion, period. So how come no law enforcement, just out of curiosity? It, it, doesn't say will. Law enforcement certainly can be contacted if the superintendent feel, if the administrator and superintendent feel it's warranted. But we didn't want to necessarily, there might be circumstances in which they don't want to involve law enforcement at that point. So we, we discussed this. I'm sure you did. I'm just want, kind of wondering why. If drugs and alcohol are illegal for anyone under 21, that would involve all of our high school <laughs> students. And if it, I just, yeah. And I think in most cases, law enforcement probably will be involved, but we didn't want it to have to be that way. You know what I'd like to do is get through all of the yeah. changes. And then, then okay. No, no, it's okay. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have discussion. Okay. Under second offense, we're making a very similar change. So it'll say the administrator will notify the superintendent, period, strike and law enforcement. And similarly, the administrator shall suspend the student for 10 days and cross out a, substitute may, shorten the word recommendation to recommend, and cross out everything but expulsion. So it again reads, the administrator shall suspend the student for 10 days and may recommend expulsion. It's hard to cross out on the yellow, I discovered. It doesn't want to take pen. On page seven, uh, under health insurance, where the yellow is, the word risk has been, uh, by mistake, left out. It should say there is an inherent risk 
associated with participation in athletic activities. Under the next yellow section, multi-sport athletes. In the beginning of the first sentence, take out the word with, so it should say an athlete may participate in one or more high school sports per season. After the word season, substitute, substitute the word, uh, include the word but, insert the word but. So they may participate in one or more school sports per season, but must declare their primary sport in the event there is a conflict. In the next sentence, uh, cross out, I think the S is meant to be, it's red because it's going to be left out, so just strike that. And in the third line, it says after a written sign of support, we change sign to letter of support from the parents. Because we didn't know what a written sign of support was. We thought a letter was clear. And that could be seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. So my question, my question was, um, why law enforcement is taken out since drugs and alcohol are illegal for anyone under 21? Um, why wouldn't they be notified? I'm going to defer to the superintendent. So I'll give you an example of cigarettes. And I'm at the freshman. I'm a freshman at high school, and I bring cigarettes to school, and I give some to Kenna. I'm not necessarily going to consider that a law enforcement call at that point. Okay. And if you say and if you say will, I'm going to interject. If you say will, it means every single time there's no room for. Okay. But why not put may contact law enforcement? Because I think we felt that that was implied. That's always an option, right? But you know, I'm sitting here thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I wish I had raised the point was, I hear this a lot, that people are saying, we know things are going on at the school, we hear that maybe it's being taken care of by the administrators, but isn't it illegal, shouldn't the law enforcement know about it? And if you don't include the statement, say, may contact law enforcement, People just quickly reading this will think that we never do it. We know they do it. But it is, it is as the superintendent has explained, it's a choice to get away as to how serious it is that should you be doing it. But I think in terms of the public relations with our community, as well as the people that are affected by this policy, that you probably should put on May contact other folks want to weigh in on that? Ms. Shumway? I just want to know, in, usually when a policy is being changed, it's preempted by something. Um, the law has been changed, and so then we get recommendations based on the law. What preempted the changes to this policy? Because we're making some pretty drastic philosophical changes to some of our, um, to this policy like with our infractions and what's going to happen if a student um, does this. It used to be, you know, you, you drink alcohol, you do drugs, which all the student athletes are supposed to be signing contracts saying that they understand that they're not to do that. It used to be you do that and you lose your opportunity to play sports for an entire year. And now it's like, oh, no, it'll only be for that one season. And I understand you get a second chance, but at what point are we saying, you know what, it's okay you're just going to get slapped on the hand so that students are then going to, you know what, there's only one day left in the season. I'll do this knowing that I'll still be able to play in my next season. Or if it happens in the off season, now in between seasons, there's no consequence in according to this policy as to what happens if in between the seasons you are doing something illegal. 
just seems like to me we're creating a lot of situations where we don't have definitive responses, and so it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. We've seen that happen in this district before and other things where days off were looked at case-by-case -case basis and how much trouble that that caused. And so I'm very concerned that we're changing a policy where it was very black and white, this is what happened, and now it's becoming a may, will, if. And I agree, certain cases, there, but if, if one student does something and then another student does something very similar and then they're treated differently, that's where the district gets in trouble. And so this kind of language is making me feel like we're opening ourselves up to um, those situations. Um, if, I, if I may, I'm going to try to represent Joel's thoughts about the initiation of the change of this policy. And please, anybody, jump in to help me out. But I think that over the last couple of years, through speakers, that they have initiated a different kind of program which says that it's important to keep the athlete close to the team and to the coach, whether in spite of whether or not they have uh, committed an infraction of the rules. And so the model has become a little bit more of a rehabilitative model, um, I think is, is, may, might be a good way of expressing the change philosophically. I've, I've had several philosophical discussions with Dr. Brown and we've talked about the pendulum and indeed the pendulum has swung twice since I've had anything to do with athletics from you're out, um, not quite for the rest of your life, but you're out for the year to um, something a great deal more lenient. Um, and who knows where it's right, but you, you see it swinging towards the more lenient right now. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'll wait in on that in a little bit, but I, I'm trying to represent it all a little bit. And that's, that's what has initiated the, the, um, the review of the policy. Thank you. Is that how I do? I think that's quite good. Yeah, I would agree with that. I thought rehabilitative was the perfect word to choose. Anybody else want to weigh in? Well, I'll weigh in then. Um, so I have been at this for a while. Um, I, I didn't coach all 39 years, but um, I was fairly involved with all of it. And um, I will be voting against this policy. Um, and the, re the reason for that is there's a couple of things for which, which have given me pause for a great deal of thought. One is the decrease in discipline. Um, and, and the reason that I was given for that is that we can't help students if we send them away from the team. We can't help them at all. Nothing good particularly is going to necessarily come of that. And I don't necessarily disagree, but I want to speak for the students who work very, very hard to do exactly what is asked of them. And it's not particularly easy to do that in the town of Winthrop. And I want to speak for the parents who have worked very, very hard to help guide their students to maintain that fine line. Um, at, the, at the team level, uh, which is not an entitlement at all, I feel as though that's a place for our students that are participating in that to feel comfortable that all people are, um, all of their colleagues, all of their cohorts are are trying to follow all of those rules. I have seen teams disintegrate from the inside out, usually because of a leadership um, student, athlete, that's involved with drugs. Everybody on the team knows about it, 
And somewhere down the road, adults do find out about it. Could be the next year. But um, I've been involved when parents and students have student athletes have pulled themselves out of teams or off of teams because of this feeling that there is an acceptance for uh, of, of drug use um, on the team and it's just all really a big joke. So I, I feel as though that we ought to honor and make room for those students that the student athletes who have worked really hard to toe the line. Uh, and I don't feel that the team is necessarily, necessarily a place for, to rehabilitate um, some of our, of our students that um, lose their way. I know that sounds pretty hard-hearted, but I feel for the students that work really hard um, to follow the rules. Another part of the, of the um, a new part to the uh, policy is to allow students to participate in two sports um, during the same season. And I'm opposed to that too. If you have a really uh, skillful and gifted athlete, um, I can understand why two coaches of different sports might want to take advantage of that person. But what that does, in my mind, is take uh, opportunity away from another student. And I would, instead of one student taking the opportunity to do two things, I'd like to see two students be given the opportunity to come to learn the skills and, and be brought along uh, instead of one person taking over two spots. So I also think that it's a great deal to ask of a student to participate in two different sports during the same season. We have a lot of students that have a great deal of difficulty balancing their academics and their athletics as it is. So those, those are my problems with the new um, policy. Ms. Um, I also didn't address this before, but the multi-sport athletes addition um, is, is troublesome to me as well. Um, for similar reasons that you stated, but also I feel like developmentally our um, high school athletes are growing. They are um, taxing their bodies in a way that um, with summer sports and only having two weeks off in August that their bodies aren't healing, there isn't rest, and then asking an athlete to participate in two sports, I just feel like it is putting them um, at a greater risk. Um, just for instance, the boys' soccer team is riddled with injuries just from their regular season schedule. Nonetheless, taking an athlete and then putting them in another situation. Um, and for instance, if you declared soccer your first sport and then you're going to cross country and you're injured in cross country, it's detrimental to the first sport. Um, so I'm just thinking- And all those team members. Absolutely. So, um, so there's that. And then the second is, is that our, our athletes are students first and um, trying to negotiate the time that it would take, the fairness of someone who just shows up for games and gets to participate in another athlete who is showing up to every single practice and then doesn't get to participate because this other person is, I just feel like it creates um, a level of conflict in our small district that is unnecessary. So I don't support that either. I, I think to be fair, I, I want to go in a little bit to, to the other side, the, the folks that would refute what I have to say, and, I, and I've been in this situation as a coach too, that you, you have some students on your teams for whom the greatest thing in their life is to belong to that team. And um, to, to, for them to be caught doing something that they're not supposed to do and be removed from the team um, takes their whole underpinning out from underneath them and uh, causes them or allows them 
to have a reason to do poorly in school, where that eligibility might have been the only thing that kept them doing what they were supposed to be doing uh, academically. So there is that other side to, to the policy. So the, the, the new part of the policy is that um, the number of days for an infraction that you're removed from the team has been decreased, it's been halved, but you still have to go to practice. So you're still there as a member of the team and still around the coach or coaches um, as opposed to being gone for a couple of weeks. You just can't participate in the competitions. I think. Is that a fairly accurate? I think so. Um, other thoughts before we vote? Um, our student, our student um, members want to weigh in on this? How are you doing, Josh, by the way? How are you doing at the first meeting? You doing okay? Good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Kenna, any thoughts? I think uh, the world changes a little bit sometimes, and uh, one of my concerns is that uh, we stay, uh, uh, we can be different, okay? But I think sometimes if that if you're in a conference, and the conference makes a change and says it's okay for a student to do two sports, okay? I don't want to see the students at winter be penalized when the other conference members or even the other state schools, or our schools throughout the state, uh, allow that. And certainly, like you, we've seen this happen on a regular basis as far as I'm concerned, but I've seen some very good examples of where students have been able to handle both situations. And so while I don't disagree with uh, what uh, Ms. Crumley had just said about the body and growing up and all the rest of it and everything, uh, I think the, the decision, and we even put it in the policy, really comes down to what the parents think. And if they say it's okay to go do it, then I don't have a problem, okay, uh, with that. I do, however, think that this policy is uh, lacking if it does not say something that, uh, that we may be able to refer any of these infractions to law enforcement. And I think that's, again, not an assurance that it's going to happen, but at least that option is there. It doesn't it, it the we, door. we publicize it. So uh, if we were to amend and to add the statements of, of uh, May, uh, notify law enforcement, uh, then I would find this policy to be acceptable. And, would you like and then it's second shouldn't be first offense and second offense. Second, both the same words. First and second, yes. That, uh, and, uh, may may uh, inform inform law enforcement. Anybody want to second that? I second that. And that's in both places. Discussion. Right? All in favor of that amendment? Amendment passes five zero. Any, dis any further discussion about the policy as amended? Okay, here comes the vote. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes three to two. Thank you, folks. I'll entertain a motion to accept for first reading um, policy KF. Community use of school facilities and grounds. So moved. Second. Christian, let's see. And are are there any public comments that will inform, help to inform the school board on this policy? Seeing none. Ms. Cook. Um, there's only one change, and it's not substantive. Um, on the. And at the end, page four of the policy. 
Uh, there's some question marks where it says fees will be charged from the following groups per day. We'd like to strike those question marks. <laughs> so it doesn't look like well, we're, we're wondering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Pachowski. I find uh, I have some concern about two elements of this change in policy. One is that it requires that outside groups uh, using our school facilities would have to provide uh, a blanket insurance policy uh, to cover that particular uh, use of the buildings, as well as any injuries that might occur uh, to the individuals involved. Uh, Isn't there that stipulation? There is that stipulation. Right. Yes. Uh, and, and my, and, and my sec second part of it is that there's a fee structure. Now, Part of my objection is that that's not the way we used to do it. And I'm not saying that what the way we used to do it is the right way, but my concern has always been I want uh, the youth of our communities to have opportunities. Many of their opportunities are based upon individual parents uh, who decide that maybe we should have a basketball team at the fifth grade level and uh, set it up. These people are not necessarily in it for the money. If they are, then I wish I had known about it earlier on. <laughs> but the point is, is that they happen because it's a grassroots type of thing. It works out well. We do have those who are in it for the money. And uh, that, to me, is, is separate and different. I'm not saying it's bad, but for instance, we used to be able to, and maybe we still can, and maybe our athletic director will be able to swing it that way. Uh, the YMCA, the YWCA, or whatever they call themselves, uh, the Winthrop YMCA, Winthrop Area YMCA, always had a blanket policy. It, they still do. And, and many of us used that blanket policy for everything that we did. I'm sorry, that's not what I thought you were talking about. No, 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 it was, a, it, it was very appropriate, and it saved us money, time, and effort, and, and things worked out that way. Uh, and hopefully that relationship would continue with those grassroots groups that I talk about. But I, I just have this thing of saying, um, we need to get more people involved in looking at it and giving their opinion of whether we should pass this. And that's one reason I'm really glad that we're talking about a first reading here. And there'll be opportunities for people uh, to take in comment further down the road. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Shumwood? Um, so to follow up on that, Joe, it's very specific that our policy says groups outside of Winthrop, nonprofits from outside of Winthrop would pay for, would pay a fee, and then for profit would, would have a fee as well, but that Winthrop-based groups wouldn't be charged a fee. Um, and so I think that that covers in the sense that people, part of our community that are paying taxes for these facilities, they still do get to use the facilities. Um, with that being said, however, I do know specifically of a time when the weather um, led to all of the high school games being canceled, but yet a youth group was still allowed to use our fields and destroyed them. And so I feel like having some sort of control over the group's further control, fees, et cetera, that it will allow for when those sorts of things happen that we do have money to then take care of things that happen to our facilities. That happened to be an in-house Winthrop group. I don't know if this policy or if there's a procedure in place that that polices when groups can and can't use the high school facilities, but it's frustrating for our high school athletes to be told we can't have an event because it will destroy our field, and then outside groups using the fields, destroying them, and then they're not in game ready condition the next time they use them. And that's the sort of push and pull that community members are frustrated with, I get frustrated with, students get frustrated with, that would lead to the necessity because people don't have as much respect for facilities as they did back in the day when you didn't have to charge anything. I'm 
glad you mentioned the outside, but in our discussion with the committee, uh, nobody brought that up that way because I kept talking about community groups. But my impression was is that community groups could, however, still be responsible for paying certain fees, such as for cleanup or for how do they get into the schools, the alarm systems, you know, whatever it takes. So they may not be free and clear of the whole thing because we do provide a statement in it that says that uh, you may have to take in the higher part of the maintenance crew uh, for four hours to come in and, and uh, make sure things are put back together the correct way. That's, a, again, you raised a good point though, and I think that's why we're gonna be discussing this further. <laughs> Thank you. Any more? Yeah. Mr. Adams. I don't know if this is the proper place to say this or whatever, but um, if they're gonna pay for cleanup, then things need to be cleaned up. And so I don't know if there's a way to put into policy that something will be agreed upon. I'll, just, I'll use the example of March Madness and that gym gets used for a weekend. Um, and those bleachers get pretty beat up. Things are swept, but they're never like washed and cleaned. Now, they look not so great necessarily when they, the group came in, but what, what is the responsibility and what should be done? And I think that that needs to be somehow agreed upon maybe per event or something as to, and again, maybe that's not within a policy, that that needs to be looked at, but if we're gonna just charge people to have someone come in and clean up afterwards, what does that clean up entail? And who's responsible for what? Um, is the group responsible for taking out the trash and the cleanup group's only responsible for filling the bins again? You know, what, so something needs to be, I think, in place for that too, because um, I don't think it's always getting done to what it should be. And I know if I was paying $35 or $40 an hour for cleanup, I would want to know that that's getting cleaned up. And when you come back into the gym the next day, and it, there's, you know, spilt soda still all over the place, what did I pay the $35 or an hour to clean up for, you know? So I think that just needs to be somewhere in the, a mesh of this thing. It needs to be spilled out. Do you want to take that back to Yeah, 
new mission statement is. Winter Public Schools core values develop and foster collaborative partnerships to build relationships and essential skills, empowering every individual to contribute to their communities and live a life of purpose. Discussion. <clears throat> Um, I did share this with um, one other person who said, so what are the core values? Doesn't say it in here. And I, I was wondering what you people would think about putting in the core values for those of us that can't read them off. Like we know that there's two R's, two C's, and an I. Um, so we know that there's respect, compassion, integrity, responsibility, and compassion. Um, do you think that it might be a good idea for the rest of the community to have it say Winthrop Public Schools core values of respect, compassion, integrity, responsibility, and compassion, develop and foster, da 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 da. Or just keep it as it is. It's, it might. It might. Um, in terms of process, this is the first reading, mm -hmm. and that should come back as feedback for the school committee to consider. And then uh, as you're thinking about adopting it, perhaps to include those. Um, my understanding of the work that evening was that was the statement people wanted sent out for its first reading. And as feedback comes back, because you may get other pieces of feedback, mm -hmm. we'll have to put that out in the impact, you know, in some form of impact form for the school committee to consider as well. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor of, for first reading, passing the new mission statement. Motion passes, 401 absent. Motion to approve the MSBA proposed resolution for the leader and the Do you think that, um, Companies do 
And it's, uh, moving forward, I think it's going to be um, just put us in a really good position um, to see what our facilities and our grounds, um, you know, if they can withstand what we're putting them through and what the future is going to look like for them. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sort of experiencing the rest of the process. So if I want to introduce, so Alan, you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, uh, we're very excited to be working with you and being selected. And uh, I, I was going to say, this is one of the most fun school board meetings I think I've been to. <laughs> uh, and it's nice to know that somebody else has technology problems besides <laughs> us. And I would highly recommend the help desk because we have one of those as a company now. And instead of me going and bugging 13 other people, I can just get on the phone and somebody can grab my computer or they can tell me which button to push. So these things help the old folks. <laughs> um, but I was going to say um, CHA Architecture, you know, we're formerly PET Architects in, 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 uh, located in Portland. Uh, we've done a considerable amount of education projects over the years, um, probably over 60 studies. Uh, two million square feet of new projects, two million square feet of renovations projects. Every single study is different depending upon what the community is asking us to do. And we never know where that's going to go. Sometimes we start over here and it leads to this and all of a sudden we're looking at a new site, all of a sudden we're consolidating. Um, and education is changing all the time. And I think the, the overarching thing that I love about uh, design for education and doing studies is um, if we can do something as architects that improves the outcome for educators, staff, and students, um, we think we've done a pretty darn good job. If we can also uh, provide value for the taxpayers um, to bring longevity and use and community use to their buildings, that's the second pillar of what we do. Um, I brought a couple of studies here tonight, and I'm, I'm more than glad to, to, to um, share those with you, but uh, just a couple of recent projects. Uh, we did a study, a master plan for SAD 53, and it started out as a master plan study, facility study, and then we ended up assisting them in uh, submitting a capital improvement uh, application with the State Main Department of Education. They now have two projects in the, in the top called top 10. Uh, we also are just embarking on production drawings uh, after a master plan that we did for RSU 26 in Orono uh, that looked at all of their buildings that confronted all the same issues that I think you have in terms of the actual physicality of the buildings, the use of the sites, can they grow into them, which ones should they shed, which ones should they take forward. Um, and uh, we, we have a local referendum and now we're, we're pursuing that work, which will include some additions. But also, they decided we're gonna let the middle school go. Because you know something, middle school was actually the high school, which turned into the elementary school, which was done in 1938. So it's time. So they decided, after all this work, let's, let's not really invest too much more in that and let's see what we can do. So we're, we're investing in the other parts uh, with those decisions. So. Uh, a lot of strategy, um, a lot of uh, pieces, community studies, but uh, I'm certainly uh, very happy to be working with uh, the Greenfield uh, Public Schools. And uh, just for the record, um, my name is Cunningham, Alan Cunningham. If you look at the name spelled out, it's a little, you might not really get it, but if you think of honeycomb cereal, and put a K in the front, and we're all set, okay? Um, but we're going to be, um, you'll probably see more of uh, me and our team in the next six months, and uh, so I'm, I'm here if you have any further questions, and I'd love to answer some of those. So. Well, we're glad to be working with you folks as well. Thank you very much, and we look forward to the next several months. Don't feel as though you have to stay. <laughs> it's okay if you want to exit. But, but the excitement's really good to take place. <laughs> That's right, it's because Joe has the floor for the next half hour. Uh, well, thank you. I forgot it was my night to cook, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's all right. It's your thank night you. to cook? Yeah, I'm more quick.
Um, let's go back to number two under new business. We have to vote. Oh, 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 we do have that motion on the floor. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion or conversation here? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion to allow Dr. Brown to enter into negotiations? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Colleen. That's Colleen. <laughs> Association has a delegate assembly. And my great colleagues here have selected that I go back again and try to you know provide, you some, to provide some common sense to that group. I, I'm thinking that this year is going to be uh, much more uh, vocal and uh, there's going to be some interest taking place in this. These, the one that's not on here, and Kristen and I talked about it briefly, but they did add the workshop dealing with uh, the proposal from the governor's office to extend uh, to $40,000 the starting pay. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, from a personal standpoint, I don't have a problem with doing that. I have the same problem that the communities are going to have. Who's going to pay for it? And the catch is, is that right now the proposal as uh, presented the first year, and it doesn't say specifically, it talks about staple pay to bring people up to 40000 But it also says that it's a pay to bring the entry level up to 40000 And that's going to have to be corrected because almost every school district in the state has anywhere from a couple to many uh, steps that take place between what they're paying right now and 40000 And all those people are going to be increased too, plus those that are above 40000 And we have seven steps that are below. We have seven. Uh, you know, we already as a state uh, do not make, meet even the standard which the legislature has passed and the people have voted for of 55%. This is going to be a humdinger. And certainly, we're going to be in that discussion uh, when we're at the conference, all of us here. But there were uh, a number of resolutions that were presented. Uh, the initial thing that I saw was 12 to 13 of these, and they had it down uh, Thank you. as a result. And some of these, the first two kind of refer to what we have within our own policy structure. One is staff use of social media. media. And the other one is school board use of social media. And they do present a uh, rationale for all of these things too, which is always nice. But essentially, it is saying that we need policies that where people understand that because you are an educator or because you are on the school board, you are representing them all the time, whether you like it or not. And when you say something, it gets out there in the public, and some of the public will see it as your statement, but more of them may see it as the statement of you as a school board member, or you as a teacher speaking for the school system. And so it's a warning as much as anything in those first two. I feel that there will be a number of uh, people who will speak up quite clearly. This is a free speech issue. And that is going to be interesting, especially with the incoming president being a leader of this free, free speech movement, uh, or at least Skip Greenlaw, who, the, who I'm talking about, has always been involved in political issues. And he comes from a very, very conservative district. And I expect that we will see that, uh, that this is going to cause some controversy about uh, accepting it. I think we've always had it for as long as I've been on the board, that we've always had it, and it's something that should be talked about 
I mean, it has been, at least at the school board level, talked about that uh, us politicians here, so, so-called politicians, have to behave ourselves a little more. I don't know what you want to do. I mean, uh, to me, it's very similar to what we already have, but um, I'm just saying that the, the, the free speech thing will probably be there. I'm not sure what it has, to tell you the truth. Either one of them. Not from the, the School Management Association. So we need to decide as a group, do we want Joe to vote the rationale or vote against that? Um, I have no problem supporting both of these since we already have policies that um, very clearly shape the use of social media for our staff and um, and for the school board. So I don't have a problem. I don't think it counters anything that we're already doing. Um, I know that within our district that there's been discussion of potentially changing one of our social media policies um, for student use of, of um, cell phones in schools and so on and so forth. So I think that if there was something from um, MSBA helping guide us as we reshape that, so that would be helpful um, as well. So I support those two. Anyone else? All in favor of um, giving Joe direction to support the rationale for the first one, the staff use in social media. All in favor? Um, five zero, Joe. The second one's kind of interesting. Um, it deals with the legislative focus on students. It's a ref it's a uh, reaffirmation that uh, the MSBA thinks of students first in any legislative uh, area. It also is an admission that it might be that we have not stressed at the legislature enough. Uh, the value, the priority of uh, this will help students. And of course, uh, I have no, no, no problems with that uh, as far as that's concerned. Uh, but I was kind of surprised when I read the, the resolution in the first thing about the fact that uh, they felt it necessary to say again that uh, we are pro-student and uh, the advantages of legislation even within the wording of the legislation, should contain how it's going to help students. Now, I would like to say a little bit um, on the sense that this might run into some problems with people who are saying, wait, just a minute. We gotta think of the bigger picture than just students. And in some cases, we have to think about our communities, what we have, what we can do, what we can afford. And the priority really has to be until we go to full state funding, is that we've got to take and make sure that we think of how it impacts our communities and what people can afford to pay. And uh, I, I, I just have this thing where this is the type of resolution that I see spending many hours on. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to say that, but some of these resolutions do go. You know, they'll plan for three hours, and six hours later, you're still sitting there. Because they've all gone home, because they've gone to the reception, they have the goodies, got the prizes, and I walk in, they're no longer there. <laughs> but it, it doesn't mention any kind of reality check at all, does it? No, no, no. In fact, it, it does say, should be on the children in our schools and not the adults. Mm -hmm. And I put in parentheses that that would mean not the adults that are paying for it. Right. Or teachers. Or teachers, yeah. Well, in, in some ways, I think they're using this um, a little bit to uh, not include the teachers. And uh, I, I personally don't think we can support it as written right now. Okay. I think we have to listen to the debate. I think we'd be better to take a neutral position right now and listen, see how it flows. Uh, but you know, you're welcome to 
and let's see the other way of life. I just have a comment. So I feel like that this is really broad, and although the intent, um, I appreciate the intent of it, but if they're talking about standardized testing, like let's relook at the requirement of that through the lens of the student, then I would be in complete support of that. But if, you know, because, I, what benefits are we getting? Even if you look at it, teach it through the lens of the teachers, what benefit is that um, providing? But because it's so broad, you then allow for other areas like late start. I mean, we went through that in our community. It benefits students, but for our community, we couldn't afford to do it. So it then, because it's so broad and it's not talking about specific items, then you do need to factor in the community's abilities. You do need to factor in those other stakeholder groups. So um, I agree, Joe, that as written, that um, I wouldn't support it. I wouldn't be in support of that. Anyone else? I think this needs a bit of a reality check. What's the consensus of the board for the third, the legislative focus on students? To not support it. To not support it mm -hmm. as written. Correct. You okay with that, Joe? I'm okay with that. Can I just whip back and make sure that um, you know we? I checked the your consensus for the first one. How about the second one? That's social media. Uh, school board uses social media. You're okay with supporting the rationale of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we did the third one, and the fourth one, and then Joe, board teacher relations. I think we're all supportive of our teacher relations and everything. Um, I, was, I was glad to see that uh, the main school uh, boards association has said that they want to help train boards and I like that part. Then they said, in interest-based bargaining. And I'm going, I wish you just had skipped the union relationship here. Because I like the collaborative relationships between the school boards and our teaching staff, you know, and, and others. That, that's good. That, that bothers me a little bit, just that little phrase in there. Because I, I do think we all need this type of training. How do we work with other people? Not just the uh, teachers, but the communities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That could be helpful. So that's where I'm at with this. So, does your opinion support the published rationale? I don't support the emphasis they have on uh, this being a preparation for bargaining. And in that sense, I'm using it as a preparation for bargaining with the union. If they had said bargaining with community teachers, you know, stuff like that, if they had broadened it a little bit, I perhaps could have agreed to it for the question. The other thing, too, is that this gets into this question of educational policy. You know, you notice the sentence that says, uh, should serve notice that more needs to be done to engage teachers in the meet and consult process around educational policy. Um, you know, the union has sought through various uh, means, including legislation, to take over more educational policy. Um, so I, I don't know why they're doing this, to tell you the truth. I mean, main school management's not going to change its position of the fact that educational policy belongs with the the elected school committees. If I could weigh in, I think that this goes along with the same rationale as the last one, that we need to take our community's needs into consideration. And although some of what was brought forth to the legislation this past session, um, a lot of it, if it was enacted, would have crippled us financially. And so I think that if you're a large school system, Maybe it would affect you differently, but we're not. We're a very small municipal school school district with um, school enrollment that ebbs and flows, and that we need to make adjustments according to those real time needs. And um, and so I, 
if that is what the intent of this collaboration is, then I wouldn't be in support of it. I'm in support, full support of collaboration, full support of getting um, feedback and input from our administrators and from our teachers about what's happening in our schools, absolutely. But if it's, um, it's for being able to negotiate on ed policy and have that be part of the contract, then, um, then that is, I would not be in support of it. I, I agree with that. Anybody else? And how shall we direct Joe? Well, again, it's the same thing. I mean, I, I could go in neutral, just listen to it, decide what to do, or I could take a position to say the way it's written, we're concerned about it, and, and we're not going to support it. Well, we're concerned about adding ed policy to the negotiations. And of course, they wrote it and added it. To yeah. It. So, so I would say to not support. Right. The way it's written. But you know why. Yeah. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. CTE funding? This, uh, one thing I would say, that the last resolution was submitted by uh, said 75 uh, school board. Every year they make a recommendation saying, or they, they put out information saying, you can support, you can submit a resolution. And I was glad they accepted this stuff because I don't, I think we're all in favor of, of the career and technical training, but they haven't just uh, you know, addressed the problem. The problem is it's money. And uh, again, my thing is that if the money's from the state, I'm all in favor of it. If the money is from the community, you know, I don't really want to go much higher than what we've got because we can't afford it. But I do believe that career and technical training is uh, is extremely important to the state. And open it up. So in many ways, I'd support this. And, and I know that it says the state will still fund it, but we all know what that yeah. might come down to. But right now, they just take it out of our general fund. Yeah, exactly. And they find the a way to take it back if they fund it. Uh, everybody agree with? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. So supporting that one? Yes. Number three, motion to accept the donation of $1,500 from Winthrop Federal Credit Union to support the life skills program at Winthrop High School. So moved. Second. This, gosh, well, any public comment? Discussion? Any comments from the school committee? That's awesome. <laughs> um, I, I assume you thank them. Thank you so much. That's really neat. All in favor? Motion passes 5 0. Okay, let's flip this page over. Does it say agenda yet? I mean, agenda, uh, agenda? No. Motion to approve the uh, recommended change to the class of 2020 graduation date. So moved. Second. Is there any uh, public comment to inform the school committee? What is the new date? Pardon me? What is the date? June 4th. Would be Sunday. So I'm going to say. Sunday. Flag day. Flag day. Flag day. Okay. Can, um, so, um, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, moving forward, if this is going to be the, I don't know who said, is it you set the date? Usually in consultation with the building principal, it's set in the calendar. Okay. And just maybe if we're going to, this seems to sort of be the trend and the rationale makes sense, maybe we want to just look at from now on doing it on a Sunday going forward. What was it was, it was traditionally on a Sunday and last year was moved to accommodate Principal Creech's personal well, graduation. So this, this, and there was some discussion at that time about whether to keep it on Sunday and that's where it ended up on the calendar, but the kids would like to move it back. Oh, they want to move it back to Saturday? No, no, Sunday. Sunday. Back to Sunday. Oh, it was okay. Saturday. Well, good. Just that one year, move it back to oh, Sunday. Okay. The other thing usually too was, um, when Miranda Cook had their graduation, because we do have some staff members that yeah. have commitments in both directions. So. 
I don't like them around because there's on Saturday, but traditionally it would happen on Sunday. Okay, um, Ken, oh, no, sorry, sorry, but can we just um, notify Project Graduation I parents? Just say that. They already called. They're calling me tomorrow. You know, okay. At 7 30. Because if someone asked me this separate and I said I would verify what the date was because they're already trying to book. Mm -hmm. um, any further discussion? All in favor? Motion passes 5 0. The school committee, open forum. Should I start with you, Kenna? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, as Mr. Camp already stated, homecoming week starts October 7th, which is next Monday. Students at Winter High School are very excited to participate in the dress up days, parade, and dance. And also, SAT Reef Cakes are two places Saturday, October 5th. Oh, good luck to everyone. Yeah. Oh, good luck to you. <laughs> yes. It's a fun time, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, thanks to uh, community members who came to our workshop meeting for our mission statement um, and, and our staff as well. Um, but it just it was a great night and a lot of collaboration. And we got out early, so we worked well together. Uh, good luck to sports teams finishing up their seasons um, with NBCs coming up. Uh, and um, also, thank you. I know we have homecoming coming up, and I'm just wondering. If there's a way to thank the community and local businesses, um, if this is about sort of coming home, we have so many businesses that help our kids in our schools, and um, it just might be, I don't know, a thank you of some sorts. Um, and I can certainly put something on Facebook too, but um, I, I just, we can't thank our community enough, and I don't feel like that we necessarily do. And I know individual teams do and things like that, but it just might be nice to have something come from the school committee. Um, do you want to try to craft a, a quick little letter? Sure. Because you've been on top of that for years. Now. Sure. I can do that. I mean, you had a mind-boggling list a few years back. Okay, I can do that. Something short and sweet? Yep. And I'll give it doing to that? Dr. Brown, or is that, yeah, no, I don't mind. Do you have anything else? Nope, that's it. Um, and, and along with the community members also, I wanted to, to add to Dana's, uh, Chef Aaron's presentation of that whole facility to accommodate um, our mission statement stuff. So, along with thank you to all the administrators and the staff. It was okay. nice. Huh? It was nice. It was nice. It was very nice. Okay, um, I just want to bring this up. Uh, I may have brought it up already, but I don't remember. But some of us are still using our phones while we're traveling. Now, I happen to have Bluetooth, and so I don't have to use my this thing. I have a pretty good directory, so I still have to press things. The real problem is people are not changing from um, requiring me to press one, two, three, four, five, six including the Winthrop School System. And, yeah, I know better, but I'm thinking that there's got to be a telephone system out there that's going to do uh, maybe a voice change type of thing. We recognize it if I said one. I know I've talked to some people who are now doing this, including Walgreens up here for a prescription or something. She spent six hours going through it, but the point is, you can do it verbally. <laughs> and, and so I'm just putting a, you know, a that's thing a, That's a good idea, Joe, because I've almost driven off the road trying to push one. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I could do it when I had the handheld, yeah. where I stayed today. <laughs> so, well, what, what hey, Siri, push one. The worst thing is, is if you've got the phone in the back in a bag or something, yeah. and you're reaching back to get it. But anyway, I just want to bring that up because that's a future planning. We are going that way. Law says I can't use my phone, so I wanted to bring that up. Glad you brought that up. A couple of things. Uh, I, I have really, uh, it seems like this year, for some reason, we've had better news coverage of what's going on at the school, the articles put in about the new staff, uh, ball game coverage, and community happenings, uh, and I think all of that is great. I certainly saw when I attended the Lisbon football game 
last Saturday, uh, just an overwhelming support of, uh, of the, uh, the parents and, and as well as uh, fellow community members uh, that made their way down there and everything. It was a lot of fun. But I also noticed, and I noticed it out here at the last football game, we need to do something to encourage our senior citizens to come out for these games. And it's not just football, it could be field hockey, it could be the soccer games, um, because I really feel they're the ones that don't feel part of things, and they also are the ones that vote against us every time we go in. And, and I don't know, you know, they're doing it through the information they get. Uh, you know, maybe they just need more information, but uh, we should think about how we encourage our senior citizens to do more with the school, this activities. Um, I think we still should have, I know we have a, don't we have a grandparents luncheon in the grade school? Yeah. yeah. We, we have a recent. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I used to have one that was great. I used to invite the parents for hot dogs, those lousy hot dogs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I those but anyway, I love hot dogs, too. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, I think in our planning we ought to look at this. <coughs> and see what more little things we might be able to do. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. That's, that's about the best Can we have a grandparents basketball game? Uh, the grandparents senior game? citizens basketball game? Oh, yeah. yeah. And they get the ambulance. Or... <laughs> no, not that they play, but that they get in for free. <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Uh, that's... I thought you play. Huh? I thought you meant play, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should like well, to have more than one hand. And, and I also, and, and believe it or not, I've had people tell me they've got to start earlier. Before they go to bed? Uh, well, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, 7 o'clock is late for them. Maybe we need to start thinking about it. Joel was here. I was going to mention it to him. Can we schedule early for some of these teams? It's not. Yeah, that's a whole nightmare with the MPA and all that, scheduling. I, I don't say it's uh, They're like two years out of scheduling, so that's a, yeah. and then, yeah, that's a getting out of school I'm already, early, too, you know, already early. Already early. You know, I have to go to bed by 8.30. <laughs> <laughs> you better hurry there, Chairman. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you got to wrap this up while I'm not talking. Laura <laughs> knows. I don't go to bed at 8.30. <laughs> My dogs don't go out till 2.30. <laughs> Since your lights, they see your lights go on. <laughs> oh, okay. Lights. Okay. Clarify their names. It's the deer. The deer come over and eat their flowers. Okay. That turns on the light. My dogs get up. Okay, we're going to move on now. Is that your last item, Joe? Yeah. I, I think it would be nice because we do need to include them. So we could do that. Mrs. Cook? Um, I'm just excited by all the opportunities that have come in, the you know, technical study and things like that. And partly overwhelmed, but um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Michelle and I? Um, one thing I, I didn't think of when we did, did we have on, originally on our calendar that graduation was on Saturday? Yes. yes. Because I know last year that when we moved it halfway through the year, that when there was a conflict with games, that the MPA said, sorry, it was on your calendar. So now that we're doing the switch again with it on the calendar, I don't know if we notify the MPA much earlier, if they would be able to take that into consideration or not. But anyways, that was a problem last year. So um, I didn't ask that question before. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about with- yeah, yeah. Would, you, would you like to direct anyone to, to do that? Well, it would, I would assume it would be our athletic director, but since he's not here, then perhaps Maybe you could Dr. Ask Brown, you could talk <coughs> with him on that and make sure. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, and then with the homecoming coming up, um, we have a lot of exciting events, one of which is our parade. And we discussed years ago guidelines for the parade. Um, and I just want to make sure that those guidelines are going to be followed. We talked about that street being closed, so that would mean that the police needs to be notified, um, have the drivers, and I guess just the chain of command, have the drivers that are driving the floats been 
told that they cannot exceed 10 miles, 15 miles an hour as they're pulling children on the back of floats. Um, well, would you like to direct anybody to check? Again, I believe that would be our, our athletic director. So Dr. Brown, if you would follow up with him and make sure that those three guidelines are being followed, that would be fantastic. And where are those? Where are those written down somewhere? If nowhere else, they would be in our meeting minutes from two years ago, I think it was. But that should be something that we have homecoming policy procedures. They're not necessarily policy, but homecoming procedures. And then that should just keep the safety or of our- Or even parade in general, if you want to correct. go that route. Yeah. We yeah. need to wait till the sheriff shows up to direct them. They put me in the middle of the parade one night when I was coming home. <laughs> That, that was bad enough, but it separated the ones behind me. I think I stopped along the way and, and watched it with your mother. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we see these people coming down, and they were just speeding to catch up. Okay. Yeah. Hold on. That's yeah, I think it's a, it's a, if we want it to be a community event where the community comes out and cheers them on and the kids are there, then it needs to be a safe place for the kids to be. I know that a lot of the, the athletes are plan the teams are planning on having candy and distributing the candy, but we can't do that safely if the road isn't closed down for that. I mean, it's literally 15 minutes. Divert traffic, so signs need to go up now saying that on Thursday evening from this amount of time, that traffic you know, on Main Street, this section of Main Street will be closed, those sorts of things. Maybe hey, do, do, do that. I know that they have in the past. I know that um, when Ryan was the town manager slash police chief that he consulted with us on that. Um, and I don't know if it needs to be said to the teams, don't throw candy while you're on, to, on 133. Wait until you get onto Main Street. I don't know, but I just feel like there's, we haven't had an accident. We've been very fortunate that we haven't had an accident, but um, it makes me nervous every year as it approaches. That's it. Um, Mr. <laughs> well, first of all, um, thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me to the board. Um, thank you, Ms. Geyer, for, um, I guess, uh, mentoring me in the first few days yeah. and emailing back and forth with Ms. Sousa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward to coming more to, uh, to coming to more of the meetings, so that'd be fun, hopefully. No, <laughs> um, Did you have fun tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, I don't. Maybe I should have talked about this when it was up, but um, and I didn't come to the last board meeting again. Sorry, I have a soccer okay. game. Um, but when we were up on technology and laptops, I know that Miss Mountcastle. Our, our teacher. She also worked really hard to get out our laptops so we could have them in time. And I know we were a little behind schedule, but I don't want to leave her out and like just say, I don't know, just say thank you to her. Um, Good point. However, it gets out. But like, I know she worked really hard, to, especially for online classes. Yep. Um, and lastly, um, I just I hope to bring forward some ideas on, and I've talked to Kenna a little bit about this, on how we can involve more students, more of the student body into decisions, not that grade schoolers would have much to say on uh, whatever, some of these big topic, topics that we talked about, but if something does come, um, now having the principals here, uh, maybe us contacting you guys on maybe like, getting some of the, I don't know, upper classmen, I guess, for, from each school to um, have some input and just some easy questions if I do see something, if we do see something pop up on the agenda and maybe contacting them to get more input on the lower grades so they get a voice. But otherwise, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, John. Yes. Uh, the, on the 11th, which is the homecoming field hockey game, the class of 89 um, state team is coming, a lot of the members are coming back um, and they're going to do a presentation for them and I believe that might also be happening in football or did that already happen? There was a bunch of alumni at a football game 
um, that were recognized. Um, and I don't know if they're doing that for um, older alumni members, but um, Joel had shared that as well. So that's just nice to see as well, is the alumni coming back. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session, please. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I thought that's one of the ones I have to read. I move to enter uh, into executive session regarding negotiations pursuant to one MRSA 4056D. Second. All in favor? Motion passes five to six. Second. Any discussion? Thank you, everybody.